Hello, everybody, and welcome to this, the Python Exchange. I am, of course, one of your host panelists. My name is James Powell, and I'm joined today by our host panelists from across the National Lab System, as well as a very exciting guest panelist. Before we get started, I want to share with you a couple of notes. First, this session is recorded. The recording will be posted online and available. If you sign up for our mailing list, you'll get notice of the recordings when they're available, as well as notice of who our upcoming speakers are. If it's the case that you think we really should have somebody come and present their prepared remarks in front of this group, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear the names of the folks that you want to hear from and the topics that you want to hear about. Additionally, if you do sign up for our ma mailing list, we do have some additional, very sporadic notifications you might have of upcoming events or of upcoming things that may be of interest to you. Of course, since this call is recorded and will be posted online, do make sure that you don't share any privileged information if you happen to have any questions that you ask or in the chat. Additionally, we have a number of host panelists as well as a guest panelist today, but if you are a regular attendee of these calls, we would strongly encourage you to reach out to us. We are always looking for more host panelists. The job is very easy. Just join us once a month to lead a conversation with your colleagues around topics that are intimately related to the work that you do and are materially affect the way in which you're able to do the research or other work that you are tasked with. With that said, I want to share with you the agenda for today. First, we are going to meet each one of our host and guest panelists and hear a little bit about what they can help us with, what questions they can answer in our work. Then we'll go through our regular coding activity. Then we'll hear some prepared remarks from our guest panelist for this evening, Katrina Reel. And finally, we'll open it up for open discussion, Q&A, anything that you want to talk about with anyone who's here at as part of our panel. And so with that said, I'll share my screen so that we can introduce you to all of our host and guest panelists for today. Behind me, you'll see my screen. I'll, of course, hide in the corner. This is the website where all of the details about upcoming events will be posted. And so, of course, if you haven't bookmarked already, please do. And our host panelists. I, am, of course, am James Powell. I work together with one of your regular host panels, Cameron Riddell, together on the NASA F-14 TOPS T grant providing open science training to folks throughout the US federal government. We are also joined by Tani Chavez. Tani, you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself, especially what kinds of questions you'd love to help answer during the session today? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'm a computational research scientist at the Advanced Light Source and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, I mostly work in putting together uh, pipelines for data analysis in general. Uh, I would love to answer questions about how to make machine learning and AI techniques more accessible to a larger community. Fantastic. Let's next hear from Dan Allen. Dan? Sure. I'm the lead of the data engineering team in the data science and systems integration program at Brookhaven National Lab. Happy to answer questions about building ad hoc ground up communities across facilities like those at the labs. We'll next hear from Patrick. Patrick? Hi, uh, I'm Schaefer. Dan and I work together at NSLS2. Um, my group, uh, I'd say, focuses more on the uh, data analysis and visualization side of things for the synchrotron users. Um, I guess I'd like to maybe um, answer questions for people who are interested in getting involved with um, existing open source uh, packages and contributing to them. Our Guest panelist for today is the esteemed Dr. Katrina Reel, who serves as the president of the NumFocus Board of Directors and is also a lecturer at Georgetown University. She has a couple of prepared remarks that we'll get to in just a moment on a pathway to open source science. She has been integral to the path that a lot of open source projects that you use every single day have taken from being just hobbyist projects or just thesis avoidance projects to the major projects that we rely on in our work. Katrina, would you like to briefly introduce yourself and share with people the kinds of questions that you like to answer for them? Sure. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Katrina Real. Um, I am serving as the president of the Nonfocus Board of Directors right now, as well as an adjunct lecturer at Georgetown University. My background is actually pretty varied. I've worked everywhere from universities to industry to um, also government uh, projects as well, especially for the military. 
Um, I've uh, implemented machine learning models pretty much across the board, all of these different um, areas. So more than happy to answer questions about machine learning, incorporating open source into your projects, um, as well as how to get more involved in the open science um, community. Fantastic. Now, why don't we move to our regular coding activity? I'll share my screen with you one more time. And today's coding activity is something that I'm sure that all of you who've had to learn programming on the job will be very familiar with. Behind me, you should see my screen. Today's coding activity is titled, I Need a Project. Because we all know when we're learning some new technology, it's always helpful to have a focused project to work on. In each round of this activity, we will pose our panelists the question of, for a given topic area, somebody comes to you and says, I really need to learn more about such and such, and the hello world is, is taking me as far as it can go. I need a good starting project for a scientific researcher or for some scientific research supporting staff to really get into each one of these topics. Let's jump right in. In round one, GPU and CUDA. You have somebody, they need to get into GPU and CUDA. They're pretty sure this is going to be relevant for their work. They've done all the tutorials, all the hello worlds. They come to you and they ask, what can I do next? What kind of projects can I work on? I guess this in one's a little, a, oh, go ahead. I, I could jump in. In a, in a scientific context, like a traditional scientific computing context, when we think of GPUs, we usually think of uh, Fourier transforms. So any technique that could use that uh, you know, going straight to x-rays. Uh, we looked at them early on x-ray photon correlation spectroscopy. There are many other use cases for that. Dan, when they pick their project, how close does that project have to match to something that is on their plate for something they have to do? And how close should that project be to just something they're familiar with that they can play around with, but it's not critical for their work? Mm. That is always the hard part. I think you want something where the, it's going to be hard to estimate how long it will take to get something that really works because you're learning as you go. And so whether you're picking a task for yourself or picking a task for a student, you need to find something that's important enough that it, there's some motivation to work on it, but not on the critical path enough that you can be flexible about how long it takes. And that's just hard. Do any of our host panelists want to comment on when you have to jump into this, should you break out your KNRC and relearn all of the C that you might have learned in graduate school, or when you're doing that project, maybe you could start with something a little bit higher level? Uh, I'll jump in real quick. Uh, I, so the first time that I started playing around with GPU computing was actually also when I was working um, at the Applied Research Laboratories at University of Texas at Austin, actually. We were using it for beam forming for active sonar um, uh, signals that were coming in. Uh, for destroyers. And I, I just want to mention that um, what was nice about that, we already had most of our code base in, you know, C, C++ at that point in time. And in fact, I was mostly working on visualization where we were doing everything in OpenGL. So we kind of wound up the de facto people having to work with the GPU in general, I think. And I think as a result of that, um, no, you don't need to go back to all of your C and C++. There are wonderful libraries out there. There are wonderful, you know, beautiful syntactic sugar on top of things. We have way, way better um, debugging tools on the GPU than we've ever had before. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that's my, my uh, take on that. When you start your project, should you start that paired together with learning a little bit more about debugging or should you just focus on some functionality? How important is building that debugging capability for that first project? Well, I, I mean, I think every developer has to have a debugger, especially, you know, so on the GPU, it's especially easy to end up with just nothing, right? Or just gibberish that comes out or simply the wrong answer. Even if you distribute a really, really simple mathematical problem out to the GPU, if you're not careful, you can end up with something that's just easily wrong and without any kind of insight into what's going on, uh, I, I just don't see how you'd be able to function because it's not just, you know, two plus two equals four, it's two plus two, you know, out onto the array and trying to understand exactly what you're getting back, right? So does that mean that you should start with a learning project where you maybe already know what the answer is so that you can spot if the code that you've written is doing the right thing or not? It's an option. That's what I did. Um, we did a traditional beam forming on, you know, just regular, G, you know, CPU 
um, and then to see how well they matched. And that's how we found that we did not match. In fact, if that we knew that the one that was on the CPU was in fact, you know, government acceptance tested, it was already out and we knew that one was correct. Um, so that um, then we could really dig in and figure out what was going on on the GPU. Fantastic. Let's move on to our next round. They come to you and they say, look, I need to put my work in front of somebody. And I'm aware that, for example, in the Blue Sky project, there are tools like Tiled. I need to build a simple dashboard, a simple web app. Maybe I want to use React because I've heard that's popular. I've done the Hello World. What kind of thing can I do next? I think the most useful way to kind of dig in is to just pick some small piece of that, like um, even within the example you talked about there of say, hey, I want to access a particular type of data or a set of images or so on, then go ahead and um, use what you've got from the hello world and try to write those components that will access just one type of data to start with um, and then try to build from there and abstract away and so on. But I, I feel like keeping it fairly limited upfront focused on, on some particular piece of data or type of data. If they come and they say, I hear there's all these fancy dashboarding technologies, I'm awash with them, and I don't know which one to pick for my starting project, and I don't know if I'm going to start with one of these and then throw it away and then start with another one, would you give them any advice? Would you tell them to start with the basics, with the core technologies? Would you say start at a very high level? Yeah, I think uh, overall, I, I think it will depend on what the end goal, you know, like of the um, of the learning process is for the, the person in this case uh, seeking advice. Uh, because there are technologies, for example, uh, there is uh, Dash Plotly, which uh, for somebody that is very familiar already with Python, it's a great introduction um, framework in order to build web apps very friend user friendly, but also very fast, great for prototyping. Um, and then if they are thinking about mainly getting familiarized with the thought process of what goes within designing a web app um, and all the technicalities behind it, maybe that's a great way to get it started before, for example, going towards React or something a bit more uh, com complex in this case. Um, but yeah, I think it mainly will depend on what the end objective would be. But there is uh, plenty of frameworks out there that has a very low introduction barrier, uh, depending on how familiar they are, for example, already coding in Python. Um, so I will probably advise them to look at those frameworks if those are good enough in this case for their development. Fantastic. Let's move on to our next round. They come to you and they say, look, I know AIML, I know deep learning is hot. I know if I put that word in the paper that I'm submitting, it will automatically get accepted by the journal, but I don't actually know what to do next. I've gone through the PyTorch tutorials. I've gone through all of these tutorials. I don't know what a good project is to actually teach myself how this might be useful in my work. Tani, do you ever come across researchers who are absolutely certain that they need deep learning, but they don't actually know what for? I think more so is that um, they don't necessarily know uh, what type of deep, deep learning architecture they should tackle first. Um, and I think once again, this may fall back onto what type of uh, question are they are going to try to answer? What what does their, their data looks like? Uh, potentially the best way to start will be to see what has been done out there. I think a great way that one of my colleagues will introduce especially students to new work will be to have them recreate something that has been already been put together, either in within, it, it could be within the same framework or within a different framework. For example, going from TensorFlow to PyTorch to get somebody more familiarized with the new framework. Um, and I think that that's an absolutely great first task in order just to get familiarized with the framework, um, see all the technicalities behind it, um, but it also to expand in this case, their uh, potential use cases in the future. So. Uh, yeah, I think maybe recreating something that may already exist or maybe a problem that they have already solved where they have full control and knowledge of what the outcome should be could be a great first step. I, I could go also add on to that just a little bit. But we see the same thing in industry, and I've actually talked about this quite a bit um, within uh, both you know Expedia and Cloudflare and different areas like that where um, 
deep learning is this hot buzzword, right? Like everybody wants to use deep learning. It makes everybody super excited and everything like that. It's not always appropriate for the problem that you're actually trying to solve, right? Um, you need a lot of data to make deep learning work. You need to have a lot of resources, compute resources in order to make it work. Um, it's not just, you know, model building, but also inference as well can also become a really big problem as well. Um, and what we found is that, you know, if we didn't have enough data, traditional models that are much easier to write, you know, most of the forest based models, things like that, perfectly sufficient, right? You can get the exact same answer with a deep learning model that it took you $40,000 to train, right, over on AWS. And so um, making the trade off, I think sometimes uh, it's not just about, you know, finding the right model, but also taking into account, are you solving the business problem that you need to solve? Are you actually using the best way to get there and something that is going to be able to integrate into the larger system that you're actually um, supporting? So, this, you know, um, I've just found that a lot of people just get really, really excited about doing it and then realize that they can get the exact same, you know, precision and recall and everything like that using a forest based model right off the shelf. Fantastic. And let's now move to our final, our bonus round. They come to you and they say, look, I, I know how to write scripts. I've written enough shell scripts, enough Python scripts. In fact, I have 50,000 lines of code using PyQt and PyEpics that I've cobbled together over the last couple of years. But I actually don't know how to make my generalized software development skills better. And I'm looking for a project that's not just going to turn into the same mix of Stack Overflow, ChatGPT, and whatever the last person did, cut and paste 20,000 times over. What kind of starting project can I learn that'll really teach me about software development, maybe even software development lifecycle, like deployment, configuration management, and similar? Dan? I would say try collaborating on others with a project that you didn't create. Um, I've learned some of the most that I've ever learned from software in open source communities, whether it's big projects like Pandas or small projects like PyEpics, where you have to read code that you didn't write and you have to deal with legacy and deal with backward compatibility. When it's you creating your own project, all of those complexities are gone. And that just doesn't, um, that changes the way that you organize and write the, and design the code, right? I want to add on to that. I agree wholeheartedly with what Dan just said. And as a way of finding an entry point, um, I, you know, sometimes projects have listed these good first issues, but even there, I feel like that's maybe a bit high of a barrier for somebody new. Um, but the way that I got involved was with some of the software that I was writing, I was finding that some of the dependencies didn't do quite what I wanted. I started off with a small PR and learned through mistakes and through the uh, feedback I got from the more experienced developers in those projects. Um, much better skills than I would have on my own, I think. Fantastic. Thank you all for joining us for this coding activity. If you happen to still be looking for a project for learning some new technology, please do feel free to reach out to any of our host panelists if you want somebody who can give you a little bit of additional advice, or maybe even say, you know what, I think you're going in the right direction, or maybe don't learn that, learn this other thing first. That's what the Python exchange is all about. And so with that said, why don't we move on to our next segment? It is my pleasure to invite Katrina Real to join us and to share with us a couple of prepared remarks. Katrina, would you like to share your screen? All right, fantastic. Um, so I've already introduced myself before, but I did want to talk a little bit about um, the open source science lay of the land, as well as what we're doing over at NumFocus in order to try and um, support this this new paradigm of the open science um, revolution. I think that's really taking place, largely fueled by open source. Just really quick, I do want to mention a little bit about my background in Python. Um, I've been using Python since 1998, and that's where I got my start, was really over on the scientific side of things. Um, at the time, my undergraduate degree is actually in molecular biology. My PhD is in computer science. But my undergraduate degree in molecular biology, I was working in a population genetics lab. And we had, as you can imagine, huge amounts of data that was coming in because it was a fruit fly lab. And so we were 
tracking genes as they move from generation to generation. And I found that it was really hard for me to find tools that allowed me to crunch data the way I wanted to. And at the time, my older brother was actually working at um, Johnson Space Center on the International Space Station, and they were using Python in order to test parts of the International Space Station before it went up into orbit. And so he was the one that introduced me to Python and started making this available to me. And as somebody who came from a science background who had no real training in computer science, it was a very easy language for me to pick up. And it made me incredibly productive very, very quickly. And it led into this interest in artificial intelligence. That's kind of a long story, um, but basically wound up working in artificial intelligence. And that's what my focus was when I was working on my PhD. Within that time, I started working on open source while I was getting my PhD. Um, and I think that this was, you know, an opportunity to be able to um, contribute back and at the same time push my own research forward at the same time. Um, and then when I graduated and had my PhD, I had, believe it or not, at the time, it was really hard to find a job in artificial intelligence. It was really hard to find anyone using Python, which were my two main, um, you know, skills I could offer the world. Um, and so I had this dream that I was going to get paid to work on open source projects. And that actually turned out to be an incredibly difficult thing to do. And um, I wound up at NDOT that a lot of people end up there. At the time, they housed NumPy and SciPy. And um, that's how my first, you know, I, I started working on open source while I was working on my PhD. But then it was a natural progression in the industry working um, in that in that context. Um, and then I was asked to join the NumFocus Board of Directors in 2018, and I became president in 2021. Um, and I obviously I'm serving with James Powell. But within that time, I really did make the switch over into industry. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I started data science teams at Verbo, which is part of Expedia, um, over at Cloudflare. I was the head of data for Streamlit, which is now part of Snowflake. Um, and currently I'm taking a little bit of a break and, you know, doing the academia thing, um, hopefully, you know, see where I end up after this, but, um, that's, that's, that's kind of where I am at. And so I feel like I've seen this progression, you know, within this amount of time of my lifetime, I've seen so many changes in the area, but for me, as somebody who wanted to be a scientist, that was really, you know, as a child, I wanted to be a scientist. But the idea of having access to all the tools and everything I needed in order to be able to be successful within a, uh, you know, a population genetics lab, I didn't have centrifuges, I didn't have PCR machines, I didn't have all of the things that I needed in order to do my job. I found that over in the open source science area, it was really clear that I could make a difference, I could work with data, and I could still work as a scientist, really, um, in in this different context, and then also be able to contribute back. And so this is what really attracted me into this area. Um, and it's something I feel very, very passionately about. This is what I give a lot of my free time <laughs> in order to help support. But I wanna talk about like, what are these pillars of open science? What do we really, really need? And the whole idea here is that we want to be inclusive, fair, equitable, and also you know in a sharing environment. Um, idea we obviously need open data right this is data metadata this is all of the different pieces apart you know that in order to be able to do your work open code is necessary because we need to be able to have things that are modifiable we need to understand exactly how things were calculated um, a lot of code acts as its own documentation i think at this point in time especially in the open science area um, having open papers so uh, a discussion that's happening across different disciplines and having people be able to access papers, comment on them, be a part of the discussion. And that leads into open reviews and open evaluation. And so all of these different pieces have to come into play. I'm obviously much more in, you know, familiar with open data and open code, but the other parts of them fall very, very quickly out of these other pieces. I think that a lot of people are familiar with, you know, the Jupiter project and all of the advancements that have happened. A lot of people are have been showing Jupiter notebooks in the same paradigm as scientific papers at this point. People are publishing no notebooks in the place of papers even. And you have open journals that are now available 
Um, you have all of these different areas that you can find scientific papers. Um, and I also just like the democratization of scientific software that's access to everyone. And also in the spirit of sharing across you know, national laboratories or universities and, and to be able to support that and be able to have reproducible science. So kind of looking back, I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the milestones in open source to kind of see like, how did we get here, right? And that starts with, you know, way back in the 1950s, 1960s, when hardware started being built. Um, and, you know, some of the big players in that area, their closed box and all of the software was shipped with the hardware. So all of these different pieces, um, you know, were all together. They tend to be very, very, um, you know, uh, how should I put it, like platform specific. But there was also an understanding, I think, especially amongst academics, that it was open. You could modify it. A lot of people had to modify it. Um, and also remember that this was before we had, you know, common operating systems and things like that in order for it to be able to work on their particular area that they were working in. Um, it wasn't really until later that the productization of software became a thing. As, you know, the hardware became more easily accessible as more people started buying hardware it was not it was clear that the product costs of producing software were going up so much that they had to start pr producing software as its own commodity and so that became a product that they sold and kind of decoupled the idea of hardware and software whereas they used to be quite intricately bound to each other but then coming into, let's say, 1974 is the first one that I put on here. This is when they decided that it was actually possible to copyright software. And before that, there was no copyright um, on any kind of software. And this, you know, falls under free speech that if you have, you know, written software, that it, the, it has the right to be copyrighted. Um, and so from there... Obviously, that's where the discussion begins, right? Like, who has access to these works? How do we share them? Um, and a lot of companies, you know, like AT and T, you know, tended to provide licenses and provide copies of different pieces of software for free, especially in an academic setting. But for the most part, especially for consumers or people that may consider themselves citizen scientists, they do not have access to these things. They're not gonna be able to get special licenses. And a lot of times that, you know, they're kind of stuck in a very, very difficult position where they're no longer able to use the software in the way that they would like to. Um, I think that a really important letter um, that Bill Gates wrote in 1976, the open letter to hobbyists is really, hobbyists is kind of the <laughs> predecessor to the word, you know, hacker, if you wanna think of it that way, but, that was where it really became clear that, hey, we have a problem with people um, either, you know, sharing software, stealing software, licenses are being, um, they're, they're not being respected. And that this is a really, this is a problem, right? As a result of this though, there a discussion started about like, what does that mean? What kind of licenses are necessary in order for us to be able to maintain this, uh, this uh, community of sharing. And so um, a lot of, you know, we'll get to the next part, but the next thing I wanted to mention was in 1983, this is where I consider this the birthplace of the internet, right? So now the reason that I chose this date, by the way, because this is a pretty contentious uh, argument, I think amongst people, but the reason I choose 1983 is because that's when the internet moved to TCP IP. And TCP IP, you know, is a standardized protocol. So suddenly we have a communication method in order for people to be able to collaborate in a way that has an open standard that anyone can program to. So now we can have, you know, um, multiple implementations of TCP IP stacks across all of these different operating systems and across all these different pieces of hardware. And now people are able to actually communicate with each other. So that's kind of another building block in getting to this idea of open source science, right? Um, moving from there to the GNU project, um, regardless of how you feel about any of the um, 
uh, you know, uh, founders of the GNU project. Um, this was a really important milestone where the idea of having free software and that free software could be distributed in a way that authors felt was um, was appropriate. And it also introduced the concept of the copy left license. And I think a lot of people probably run into this, that if you do have a work that you've been working on, um, you're using some sort of software package, and then you modify it in some sort of way, you have to copy left to the, to the um, license that the original um, piece of software had. But now we have a means and a, an idea around the idea of actually sending out you know, free software. And so one more building block is in place. We have to have that open code, okay? The next piece of that I just wanna mention is that 1989 is when we start seeing the BSD license come up. So the release of 30, 386 BSD, um, you know, it was an operating system that uh, at the time, the I feel like the more important piece of the BSD operating system is the BSD license because it dropped copyleft first off and it was the predecessor to the MIT license. There's a lot of contention between, you know, BSD and MIT, which one came first, who created which one, everything like that. But the old the whole idea of free and fair use that anyone would be able to have access to the code running on their computer and that they would be able to modify it any way that they wanted to was now solidified that these licenses allowed people in order to do this, um, that there was a mechanism in order to do, um, you know, the sharing environment. I would say that, you know, BSD and MIT licenses are probably some of the most popular licenses I see anyway in a lot of the projects that I um, work with. But um, obviously there are a ton of licenses out there. If you're ever interested, check out the OSI website. You know, you can see a whole list of them. Go over to Creative Commons, everybody. There are just a ton of licenses out there. I'm not a licensed lawyer. Um, I've just kind of come, come across several of them. So no comment there. But I do think it's important to talk about like now we have a license, like in keeping with copyrighted materials, an ability to share, we have a communication vector in order for us to be able to share code. And then the next piece that comes out of this is then the release of the Linux kernel. So once we have release of the Linux kernel, now we have a platform that's open and shareable. And then we also have an operating system that is also shareable, right? So now we've moved on to another piece falls into place where we have a common way of running our software as well. And then moving on just you know over to 1993, the founding of Red Hat, what we saw was that it proved that open source could be a successful business. Um, the first day gains of Red Hat when it went public were some of the highest that have ever been seen on Wall Street. And they really paved the way for companies to be able to do open source and show that it could be profitable at the same time. This opened up, you know, the door for um, Mapbox and Grafana and all of these other different um, uh, companies that are out there built on top of open source software. And Red Hat really was the first one to just kind of throw that out there. Now, moving on to 1997, I do want to mention uh, Eric Raymond's um, paper, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. This turned into a book, but the, it started as an essay. And the idea here was there were two paradigms for producing software. First, you have the cathedral, where you have basically releases of software, but in between the time that things are released, you have a group of people who are working on it. And they're off in their own little corner of the world and they're collaborating and creating software, but it's not really shared. There's not communication outside of this group of people. And the next time you see it, it's going to be released. That's in that next release is when you see it. And then you have the idea of the bizarre, where that is just software that's developed out in the open, that everyone can see who is doing what. Everything, roadmaps are open, code is open, development branches are open. Everything is just 100% open. And the idea being that with these two different paradigms, 
that the bazaar can get more eyes on your software, basically, and tap into that power of having most, more people being able to collaborate. And so from there, we move on to 1998 with the open source initiative. I do want to mention that one. Um, I mentioned their website, you know, they can look up licenses and things like that. But I think that um, you can see that now we have all of the different pieces in place. We have open code, we have um, open communications, we have an ability to democratize data, we have licenses that cover data, we have an ability for us to talk about in a, in a vocabulary built around the idea of open source. And so from 1998, I'm gonna jump right over to talk a little bit about the Python scientific ecosystem evolution. Um, I don't know if a lot of people realize that, you know, uh, um, Greta Van Rossum was actually at the meeting where they coined the term uh, open source, you know, as run by uh, O'Reilly um, was, was the one that um, started that, that um, meeting. But anyway, uh, Python was obviously, um, it, I feel like Python is very, very tied to open source as an open language, right? It, you can't really <laughs> interact with Python fully, I think, without understanding at least a little bit about open source. Um, I was at PyCon this last year um, and it was really cool. I think that seeing the quote, you know, Python is the people's programming language, I think is actually appropriate. It's completely available, it's easy to use, it's right there. And then on top of that, we have, we see this evolution of scientific software that's been built on top of it. Um, and I'm not gonna go through every single one of these projects, but a lot of these should be um, familiar to you. Um, my first foray into uh, scientific computing was roughly around 1999, after I started learning Python in 1998. And that really was around the time there was Numeric and there was another package called NumArray and there was a big hubbub about which one to use and everything. But I've watched the evolution of all of these projects every bit along the way. And what you see is that through this evolution, everything is built upon another piece. Once we have something like NumPy in place, then you have all these other packages that can be built on top of it. SciPy can be built on top of it, Matplotlib. Um, Pandas is 100%, you know, built on top of NumPy. Um, uh, and then you move into, you know, different paradigms on top of that, the idea of, you know, Numba, like just-in-time compilers, Jupyter with, you know, ability to share as well as presentation layer um, on top of being able to, you know, almost become an IDE for most, um, most data scientists. And then, of course, moving into Dask and moving on to GPUs and distributed computing and TensorFlow. But none of these happened in, in any kind of um, bubble, right? This is a community. The ecosystem all had to kind of, you know, work with each other and be able to build upon each other. And each piece that built on top of it created more and more of this ecosystem where there's an interdependence upon all of these different projects. They're not really able, I think, at this point to operate 100% independently. Um, I mean, there is a cooperation that has to happen, I guess is what I'm really trying to say. Um, and so um, from here, I wanna introduce NumFocus a little bit. I apologize, this graphic is a little old. We actually have more uh, sponsored projects than this at this point. Um, but this is an older uh, graphic of, um, of all the projects in, that are sponsored, fiscally sponsored um, projects as part of NumFocus. And so um, I basically the idea of NumFocus is to create a home for different projects. So we have, um, as a fiscal sponsor, we become basically the legal entity for the projects that are underneath NumFocus. They maintain their own bank accounts. They have money that's coming in, they're paying people underneath all of their projects. But things like trademark, you know, legal questions, um, you know, any kind of, you know, holding their bank account, things like that, um, events. So the Pi Data events, um, all of those things fall under NumFocus. And so um, 
I think it's a very interesting organization. Obviously, I give a lot of time, so does James, in order to um, support GNOME Focus. But as somebody who saw what the open source ecosystem looked like before you had an entity like GNOME Focus, I think this is revolutionary. The idea of having a place where you can have a home that provides you know, some stability um, for all these open source projects is unbelievably important. And also um, a way for us to be able to support both our developer community as well as our user community and bring them together in educational events like PyData, for example. Um, and so obviously very much a, a supporter of the open source community. Um, I can't even begin to talk about all the different scientific discoveries that have been made using different projects and on, on here. Um, and so from here, I did want to start plugging a little bit. There's a new program under NumFocus. Um, we're calling the Open Source Science Initiative. So not to be <laughs> confused with OSI, this is OSI. Um, I know that's a little bit confusing, but um, the idea is that OSI will serve as an avenue for connecting open science stakeholders using and developing open source software within the NumFocus ecosystem. The facilitation of these networking opportunities will bring together participants from NumFocus projects, academia, government, and industry to openly collaborate on common goals. Um, and so this was just started this last year. Um, and already you can see um, connections being made. So different projects at this point, there is a pretty wonderful map, I think, of um, all of the, well, I'm just gonna pop over to the website real quick, but um, hopefully you can see this, but the idea here is that right now, I feel like it's just being used to create connections. So people can find out like who all is working in this area, right? Are you a developer who wants to support this open science initiative? Is this something that you wanna create the sustainable reproducible science environment? Um, and you can, you know, there's letters of support, there are ways in order to be able to get connected. Um, it's very much in the organizational phase right now, since it is, you know, relatively new. And we just got a program director hired, like just a few months ago, really. Um, and so um, you can also join the interest group and, um, you know, all those wonderful things that are going on right there. Um, and I, I do think that this is a really, um, once again, a very, it, 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 to, for someone like me to have seen us come this far, I think is really meaningful <laughs> to be able to see that like, not only have we built this entire ecosystem, we've seen all of these different pieces fall into place in order for us to be able to create, um, you know, create software to put powerful tools in the hands of people um, with no entry cost, right? And really, you're only bound by the amount of time and imagination you're willing to put into a project in order to be able to share it and put it out into the world, I think is an unbelievable gift. And so um, obviously, the other side of this, though, is that none of these things happen without an ability to, like, we all have bills to pay, right? So how do we create a way for open science and for people working on open source projects to still be able to um, pay their bills and create, you know, have a decent living. I do find it very interesting that open source software has powered so many different businesses and um, areas, but has sometimes really struggled for any kind of support financially. So those are some of the problems I think that, you know, both NumFocus and o OSI are trying to solve um, in the long term. But um, from there, uh, I kind of feel like, you know, the sky's the limit. We'll see where we can go with this. And I do think that we are seeing more people, you know, especially from government, especially with the TOPS initiative. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but um, there is more interest coming in from government, um, as well as we have been working quite a bit with um, some of the security um, coalitions that have been forming in order to ensure that we have uh, better security across open source packages. Um, and um, 
I am really, really excited to see where we go from here. But I do think that, you know, maintaining that openness is going to take effort. It's not something that we can take for granted. Um, and understanding where we came from and how hard people had to work in order to build this paradigm that a lot of people have been dropped into, I think is really important for step in order to be able to understand, like, how do we protect what we've all worked so hard in order to build? Um, and so really, really looking forward to working with people in the future to see this grow. Thank you for those remarks, Katrina. We'll now open it up for some open discussion, some Q&A from the audience or from our other host panelists. Can you offer perspective on in those moments when this community seemed like it might splinter over things like num array and numeric or other sort of decisive technical moments in, in the evolution of the ecosystem, maybe the relationship between pandas and NumPy uh, taking the long view of it, what what made the community stick together? What kind of made it work and not completely fragment over the decades that this has been going on? Well, first off, I do want to mention that there is this is powered for sure by some very, very passionate people who truly believe in what they are doing, right? So being able to have those leaders who can pull a community through those times, I think is first off really, really important. Um, I also do appreciate the fact that with the democratization of different projects and also of open code, that a lot of times, you know, it becomes a bit of a meritocracy, the best tool wins, right? I definitely did my own benchmarking tests for num array and numeric and decided that numeric was the one that was the obvious winner for my project, right? So that becomes now I become a user of that project. Um, and so I think that you can I actually think that that's one of the, the strengths is that you can put a new idea out there and then let's see who what people see work, right? Um, things are going to rise and fall though. I, I think that it's really, um, uh, it, it's unreasonable for us to think that this ecosystem is going to remain this way forever, right? <laughs> there are going to be projects that are going to be built on top of this. There's going to be new trends that come in. There are going to be faster ways to do this. We're going to see projects, you know, um, people move on to different things. We see people, you know, working on other things. I, I just, I think that we have to be careful about how we manage the change as opposed to trying to, uh, avoid the change, if that makes sense. So um, the the benefits that you listed um, for for why people have gotten involved in open source, I'm I'm just curious to hear more of your thoughts on what keeps private companies investing in it. You know, whether it's monetarily or or for encouraging their employees to to spend their time on it. Is it simply a generational thing? People who learned a certain way are now in those positions. Or, do, you know, what do they see in terms of return on investment, for instance? Sure. I mean, that is actually, um, that's a great question, first off, right? Because <laughs> it, it ties into a lot of fundraising. But um, at the same time, a lot of companies at this point, like if there are open source projects that their core technology is built on top of, if those projects were to fail, they will fail as well. They're going to go down right along with it. And so there is that interconnectedness of, of different concerns, right? So not only is it advantageous, I think, for them to be able to, you know, hire developers who become core developers, for them to be able to give money into projects so that they can hire their own developers or maintain some sort of, um, you know, stability. I, I, I just think that people are realizing that we're all much more connected than they think they are. I, I think that, um, I wish that I could see more people giving back and more more interest, I think, in giving back and creating that. I know that there is a um, there's resistance to helping your competitor, but I, I really don't see it that way, that we are in very much a coopetition. I hate that word, but at the same time, you know what I mean, um, environment where we're all, like I said, standing on each other's shoulders in order to get to that that goal and that vision that we want to get to. I think I'm curious more so um, in terms of 
how can, as a research scientist, for example, make sure that the code that is produced within our teams, for example, um, are inclusive, fair, uh, they, for example, follow these uh, principles of open source. Is posting just a code online enough, probably with one data set that we can reproduce all the time? What are kind of like some guidelines or advice that you could share in this case with research scientists on how to make uh, code accessible to other communities? So I I have so many things to say here. <laughs> just organize my thoughts for just a second. Um, first off, I do want to mention that um, there is a website out there. I just want to plug this for a second for um, research scientists as research uh, scientists like engineers. I forget exactly what the term is um, that uh, that's been put out there to promote the idea of having good software practices first. I think that that's one of the biggest barriers, I think, to uh, smaller projects that may be coming out of laboratories. I saw this happen, um, well, not firsthand, but I saw this happen at NASA with my brother. They do have all of these different, you know, um, avenues to be able to open source software. But at the same time, if you just throw something out on a website and it doesn't have best practices, it's not using the canonical Pythonic way of doing things, if it's not modern enough, Nobody's going to look at it. Nobody's going to be able to figure out how to use it. Nobody knows how to actually integrate it. Um, there are a lot of different, I think, projects that are out there that are written as applications. And I know that it is an art in order to be able to actually write good libraries. But having people who can factor out libraries that are very um, accessible, I think, is essential. You, you don't necessarily want to have people that are carving out the the pieces that the, they need from a project that's been thrown out onto a website, right? So first, those software engineering practices really come into play, right? And I mean this with great love as somebody who, <laughs> who has supported a lot of scientists over the years, is that a lot of the code is not all that pretty. I'm just going to say it, okay? And I think that if you dig into the bowels of sci-fi, that you can see very, very quickly that there is some pretty ugly code in there and some pretty ugly um, pieces that have, have remained over the years. And so I think having that really, um, ha recognizing the fact that you're gonna need to have some engineering practices on top of it, make some kind of investment or find somebody who's passionate about the project who can make that happen. So making it accessible in that sense. Um, I also think that, you know, throwing things out onto a website is probably the worst way that you can possibly do this, right? So getting hooked up with some sort of larger organization, being able to put it out in something that is searchable. I mean, you can even throw things out on GitHub. I don't know about y'all, but go, GitHub is starting to become the Wild West. Um, it's a very different place than it was in like 2010. You know? So um, let's, uh, it's, it's become a very, very different place. Um, but at the same time, uh, I do think that um, also having discussion around it. So having open communication around a project is really, really important. So not only are you promoting the project, you have it freely available, but then the conversation continues. It's not just something that is going, it's a living, breathing, healthy, piece of software that's out there that is going to change and it's going to grow as not just be something that's stagnant as somebody who is you know um as a leader especially in my um data science teams that i was running or starting or whatever people would come to me with projects that they wanted to incorporate into the code base and i would have to be able to look at it and say like okay is this going to be around in a couple years right I need to build a platform that is going to last, that we're making the investment that's going to last five to seven years. Is this project going to exist in five years? Are we going to be able to maintain it? Is this something that's going to, or how, what is that maintenance burden going to be like on top of, on top of everything that I'm trying to use in my business? But I think that the same thing happens when you're trying to do reproducible science and you're sharing that software and you realize that like, oh, okay, I have this, you know, Jupyter notebook paper that I've put out there and now nothing runs because I didn't, you know, have configuration control. I didn't, you know, have any kind of um, management around it. So all of these different pieces in order to be able to create a scalable, maintainable project um, have to be um, incorporated.
and I, like I said, I could go on about this forever um, as an engineer, as somebody who I feel like can kind of cross the line between both of these different roles. Um, I have a lot of a lot of opinions, but I'll stop there. <laughs> Katrina, I really liked in your prepared remarks how you tied all of this to the historical context. And I really like seeing your perspective, having been there from the very beginning. Is it the case that open source has just one that we can just take for granted the enormous success it has? Or are there still challenges where perhaps actors trying to push some sort of vendor technology or proprietary technology might still be actively trying to undermine the open source mission? I, I think that's an easy yes, right? But I, I think that we've seen, um, I'll just start with within the last 10 years, how many opens, like how many startups have you seen start on top of scikit-learn and almost nothing else, right? As like their entire core technology, right? And how much of that has actually been either contributed back or has even had any kind of conversation with the project, right? And that's an incredibly successful project that's, that's out there. I think that it's actually quite clear that people take for granted that this community exists and that it will, you know, continue to do all of these different wonderful things. I think that a lot of people are really shocked when they find out that open source uh, developers may struggle to, you know, make a decent living. Um, when I've told people that, you know, NumPy developers are not millionaires, they're, they're just absolutely floored. Like, how is that even possible? Like, it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous at this point. Like, why are they not you know, just like ruling the world at this point is because everybody forgets about the people behind these projects, I think. And I, you know, to that point that, um, you know, a lot of the technical decisions, a lot of the paradigms, even the idea of projects, you know, these are people we're talking about. It could be, you know, just a couple of people sitting down at a table and brainstorming something that becomes something like, you know, um, Numba, or I can, I was at the table, I think several times when we, I'm talking about Bokeh, I didn't end up working on it. I worked on a predecessor to it. Um, but uh, there, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's really important for people to see the faces of the people that are behind it and realize that this is a community that needs support and needs people to um, give back and not take it for granted. And we have one final question from a member of our audience who asks, use the phrase Wild West in reference to GitHub. Could you elaborate yeah. on how GitHub today is different than how it was in, say, the 2010s? Oh, no, it, 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 that's not like disparaging. It's more along the lines of like, I can't find anything. Like if I, if I just get out there and I search like Python, GPU, blah, 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 whatever, everything from somebody's, you know, high school project to you know, a, a major project can end up coming up in the search. Um, and that's what I mean by a wild west is that I'm not trying to say that people are like doing anything wrong. It's just really, really, really hard to find what you're looking for, especially if you're just poking around looking to see what people are up to these days, right? <laughs> it can be, um, it can be kind of rough. <laughs> so that's the way I look at it. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Katrina. I think that brings us to the end of our event. I'd like to thank once more our host and guest panelists for making this event a success. Do note that we will not be meeting again next month. We will postpone for December and meet again on the 31st of January. Sign up for the newsletter, the mailing list, if you want to know some details about the speaker for January, as well as our upcoming speakers, as well as get information about the videos and other resources that may be available to you. If there's somebody that you really want to hear from, maybe a core developer of a project that you're interested in using or a project that you really, really are using right now, and you really need to just get in front of them, please reach out to any one of your host panelists and we can set that up for next year. We really want to hear from you who you'd like to have come present in front of all of you. And if it's the case that I keep seeing the same names on the attendee list going into next year, we are going to reach out to you and ask you if you'd like to be, join us up here as one of our host panelists. You all know who I'm talking to. But with that said, thank you all for joining and we'll see you all next time.